We need to talk about live tools, talk about the basic monitoring concepts and four modes of monitoring the system. I want to start talking about some of the Linux monitoring tools. I've been using SAR quite a bit already. I need to go through some of the top information. There's also VMstat, and I've also been using SlabTop and IOTop. There's also a command that I like to use that I download from the web called Nmon, comes from IBM. Main reason I like it is for the disk farm capability. I'll explain that when I get to it. Then I also want you to be used to using PM chart and PCP. PM info to get the statistics. And two things that are in the PCP RPMs right now, top disk and top sys, they might get moved. Those are in the uh, PCP-SGI RPM. For GUI, PM chart. Now, I was on a site last week that DKViz was unusable with 1,400 devices to it. You could not use DKViz. And there is another one that I should mention in here that I use quite a bit, PMG sys or PMG cluster. And another thing I need to demonstrate is to be able to play back an archive. Also, I have my own shareware stuff. If I've got some sort of widget or tool that somebody has written or I have from a prior uh, case study, I don't throw the tool away, I save it off. Uh, that DLOOK summary that we were just looking at is an example of something that uh, somebody else wrote. I've kept on to it for a year, and now it's getting integrated into a uh, performance suite. So when I'm looking at the system, I've got two perspectives. I've got to look at the overall system activity, and then on a per-process single program execution. Again, SAR, PCP are telling me what the system's doing but not whether I'm getting any work done. I need to get to some sort of time domain and accounting data to see how long the program is taking to run. Now, when I'm analyzing a system, I'd like to start off with a baseline. The baseline gives me a reference of where I typically am. For example, how many contact switches do I typically have on my system? Uh, another day or two, we might start actually start getting a baseline, but we're not actually running many of the code one through code nines yet. Also, it's probably not written in the labs, but I have ganglia RPMs that I'd like to put into place. And then I have a tool that I wrote a long time ago back in Cray days, then ported it to IRIX, and then ported it to the Linux. It's a tickle GUI that will plot SAR and PCP and PBS data. I want to demonstrate that for proof of concept. So, so far, I have not done any baseline type of stuff. Live, I've been spending all my time so far on SAR, TOP, and PM chart, going through the CPU user time, CPU system time, the memory, the swap, uh, the disk drives, file system buffer cache, IPC, and started looking at NumaLink traffic as well. Now, if something is interesting that's going on, I can save. When I was in PM chart, there was a record button, and I can save what I'm seeing on the screen and play it back later. You've also hopefully put PM logger in place and have archives for me to look at. If I use PM chart with a dash A, and specify a .o file, I can play back that particular archive. I've also been getting close to an unresponsive system, though I have not hung it yet. But I have gone into postmortem and looked at things with KDB. And by crash, I meant if I actually took a panic and had to force a K-dump to look at something. So we need to spend a little bit of time in the baseline and retrospect. Again, when I'm looking at the system, I want to start off with the big picture. I basically start off with the SAR-U to say how busy are CPUs, how busy is the uh, system time, IO weight, things of that sort. I need to have some sort of perspective. What is your system time typically like on the system? 
In other words, I need to have a reference. That's what the baseline gives me. It tells me if the number is in range or an abnormal out of range type of number. So some of the basic commands, VMstat's been there a long time. VMstat will show me my user system, show me my memory, show me my I.O. Problem with VMstat is there's nothing historical there. It's only on the live system. I'm going to go back through top in more detail. And we've been using the SAR command. Again, I have a cheat sheet. Let me click on that cheat sheet here. And the second page is kind of giving you the different SAR options as a refresher to look at the different types of resource consumption. I've been using strace to trace my system calls. Now, strace does not give me system time. strace just tells me what calls I'm doing. I'd actually like to jump off here to my desktop for a second. So I don't know if I'm going to catch it here. Uh, let me do something else here. we are. We have a workload running. So if I do an S trace, I always like to use the dash F to follow any forks that might occur. If the forks occurred before I run S trace, I won't be able to see them. Then there's some T options here to give me a timestamp, then a P for a PID. Let me just pick 63371. And it's kind of hard to see here right now, but the F, the first field, is giving me the PID that's making the system call. The T's gave me a timestamp. Then I've got my system call. Then I've got the arguments to the system call. I could do a man two, and then look at what these arguments are. After that is the equal sign and then the return status on the system call. This is the error null. And a P error would print out something like resource temporarily unavailable. And then after that, this thing right here, that is the wall clock time of the system call, not the system time. The only way I can really figure out what system time is is from the perf record dash G. So the T options that I used gave me some timestamp information, but that was wall clock time, not user or system CPU time. Also, this file can get rather big, and I really can't grep it. It writes it into standard error, so I often use a dash O and create a file. And that seems good enough. There is an option there to specify how long I'm going to trace it. But now I can do a more on that strace file and look at it more closely. Now, the thing about reading an strace file is you don't want to get stuck between the lines and spend it, you know, every line by line and pull them apart. You kind of want to skim read it and look at the big picture. So I'm seeing this thing doing a select on some sort of network socket doing right, select, right, select. I'm just wondering what else was out there. Okay, anyway, go back to the workbook. So you got to be careful about S-Trace. It will tell me what system calls I'm making. Again, it will throttle back the application. If that application is doing heavy I.O., 
the intensity that I was going to drop back because this process will be throttled back by writing all this S-Trace data out. I've also been using list my open files. In particular, I was looking for dev shamem types of files or any sort of slash dev raw file that I'm looking at. Use the watch command every now and then, just for example, watch df-i, for example, to watch my inodes. I've used slab top when I have a large slab. I don't ever use proc mem info anymore. Instead, I use nmon. There is a sock list command to show me what sockets are open. One of the things that can happen with your system, something called a zombie. If a process terminates, there is a socket timeout, and that process might stick around for a while holding that socket and showing up as a zombie until that socket timeout limit has been reached. So sometimes you can see a zombie get its PID. How would we get the PID for a zombie? Uh, let me go back to my workbook. A zombie is going to have a state of a Z here. I want to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to do a memhog, 100 gig, get it started here. I'm going to do a control Z and put it in the background. Now, if I bring up top, I see one that stopped. It won't show up here because it stopped and not using any CPU time. This one would be the zombie, but I don't have a quick, easy way to create a zombie right now. But now if I do a PS-EL pipe grep uppercase T, close the quote, the T indicates that it is a stopped or a paused process. In fact, it is in a single handler routine. Now, if I wanted to look for zombies, I would put a Z in there instead of a T, but I don't have any zombies right now. Now, that memhog that I put in the background, what do I do with it? How do I get it? Let me do a kill all memhog. Still there. Bring up top, it's still there. That process was put to sleep in a pause situation. And signals, most signals are masked. So kill dash L shows my, my signals. What it got was a signal 19. This is the same signal that PBS Pro will use for job preemption to suspend a job. Now, when I sent a 15, that is pending. If I want that job, that process, to see that termination signal, I need to send it a continue. And now we see the process did actually get its termination signal 15. Now, if I sent a hard kill with a 9, one of the problems there is, particularly like in a batch environment, the batch scheduler will send a 15, and then the application can do a library call to catch that signal and basically jump off to a single signal handler that can say, if I get a signal 15, let me jump off to a cleanup routine, close all my files, close all my network sockets, write a checkpoint file off, remove my shared memory segments, and then cleanly terminate. If I sent a 15, it would never jump to the single handler routine and then I could end up with a memory leak, depending upon what that process was not able to clean up with. So a 9 would have been picked up, but then it would not have had a grace period between the 
determination and the kill. Any questions on that? So anyways, I kind of got distracted. I was talking about sock list and how I can have zombies, but then I went off to a uh, something similar to a zombie. I put a process into a stopped pause state. Uh, XOS view, I don't use much anymore. I use PMG sys instead. And again, Nmon I'll show you, and then there's IO top that I've been using. For PCP, PMCD has to be up and running. That's my data collector. PM Logger is the one for my archives. Uh, I got a site right now. We're running PM Logger for a month. We are not collecting disk, 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 disk statistics because that was uh, too much data. The files were too big. But primarily I want PM Logger data so that I can look at the uh, dirty, right back, NFS unstable type of statistics and break my memory usage out in better detail. SAR does not break that out. So we got PM logger running. One of your lab exercises would have been to get that working. PMIE, my performance metric inference engine, is an alarm mechanism. We have not configured that yet, but we did see a load level alarm going off today in bar log messages. PM info will give me information about the statistics. Again, let me go off and share my desktop. So I like to do a PM info dash T, print that out, have a hard copy, and then you can see where to find particular statistics. For example, we were just in the VM stat area. Here's memutil, memnuma. There's my VM stat talking about compaction, inode steel, things of that sort. What PCP doesn't have is access to the uh, the stuff that was in this kernel. Oops. That stuff. So I can't get to that stuff through PCP, but I can get to the stuff that was in slash proc slash VM stack. So this is some of the stuff we were plotting in my example. Okay. PM val will give me a raw value, give me an ASCII interface for a command for a metric. And a PMDA, Performance Metric Domain Agent, is able to add statistics into PCP. Let me demonstrate that right now. I'm going to go off my desktop. Let me do a PM info on XVM. There's nothing there. PS-E and grep for XVM. There is no PMDA for XVM. I'm going to go into var lib PCP PMDAS, PMD, Performance Metric Domain Agents. Here's one for Luster. Uh, the one I wanted was the XVM one here. Let me go into that one. So to run this, and I have to do it from the current working directory, I can't run this as a full path. And if I do a ps-e in grep for PMDA, I now have a PMDA XVM running. And now if I do a PM info on XVM, I can see what statistics are available to me there. Let's do a PM info type rep luster. Nothing there. Let me go up, go into this luster. Let's 
let's do an install here. Now, I don't re actually have any luster here. Nothing to look at. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. So now if I do a PM info dash T, let's grep for luster. Now I've got a whole bunch of luster statistics that are available to me coming out of slash proxys LNAT stats or proxys luster. Those are the directories that the data is coming from. Let me go back to the workbook. So there are different types of PMDAs that can be done there. There's another one I like there for attaching to a process. Go up a directory. PROC, is that the one I want? Dot slash install. I'm going to install it as a daemon. Looks like I got four metrics available to me. Oh, 96 metrics here. Let me do a PM info. So I have a whole bunch of proc statistics that are available to me now. And uh, not sure what I want to look at here. User time, system time, things of that sort. Now, to get rid of that thing, I'm going to do a dot slash remove. Well, before I do that, ps-e grep for PMDA. So there is the PMDA proc daemon that I just fired up. Let me remove that thing. And let's see if I've got... And notice now in PM Info, I don't have any of those proc statistics. I'm going to try this other one here, process. It doesn't look like it did much. PM Info, rep proc. I don't know really what it did. All I'm seeing is this one is, is new. So I don't think it really added much for that one. It was the other one that I cared about. Let's remove that thing. Proc was the one I wanted. see what I can do here now. I'm going to bring up PCP on my uh, laptop here. I want to do an open view. I want to switch it to Floyd 3. If that PMCD could not be talked to or have an open port, then uh, we would get an error there, but that worked fine. I'm going to hit CPU here and open. Now I'm also going to try a uh, Add a tab, and let's see what I can get here. New chart, and there is the proc group. And let's look at PS Info. And then you've got all the information I wanted to try to find the uh, user 
computer time and system time here. There's my U time. Expand that, and now I've got each of the individual PIDs. Let me pick this one here. There's my user time. And let me get the system time here for the same PID. If I can find it here, 065129. Zero six five. One, two, nine, right there. Supply that. That's my user and system time. Let me hit an OK. And let me edit the chart and turn it into a stack bar. And actually, it doesn't look like I'm getting any time associated with it at all. Looks pretty empty. kind of worked before, but I don't know why. Yeah, not giving me anything here. Of course, if that process is sleeping, we're not going to see it. We won't have any user time or system time if it's sleeping. But I'm not sure that I'm actually getting data out of that thing either. Try to find something else. Just looking here. So I don't really have any user system time going on for anything. Everything seems to be in a wait state of some sort. And that's why it's not really helping me. So let me come back to that later. Okay. So I was just trying to demonstrate some different performance metric domain agents. There are ones for InfiniBand as well. To look at the data, I've been using PM Chart quite a bit. There's going to be a dedicated lab for you to reconstruct a, a set of charts like I have done, in particular being able to build that memory map. Also, again, on Floyd 3, I have a DAW example that you could grab and use my example. Another one, PMG SIS. Let me bring up, hang on, let me bring up my desktop. Oh, my slab is still not trimmed down yet. So I'm going to do a PMG SIS. And on a big system, this is the only way to really see the entire system. So here I can see two drives that are hot. I can see a little bit of system time going on occasionally, but most of my CPUs are idle. Just waiting for something to happen. Don't really see anything happening there. I can also do a VI on ITC nodes. And in here I'm going to put in void uh, 1. Floyd 2, Floyd 3, NAS-server, and DMZ-server. Let's see what they look like. And then I've got a PMG cluster command. And now I can kind of look at all five, four of my systems that I have here, five of the systems actually. So I can see my Floyds, I can see my NFS server, NAS-server, and I can see the DMZ server itself. I can see Floyd 2 does have a lot of IO8, a little bit of system time. Floyd 1 is pretty idle, and Floyd 3 is pretty idle, except I can see in Floyd 3 disks. By the way, in a cluster environment with CXFS, this can be helpful to find the device, actually find the host that's writing to your CXFS file system. So on the metadata server, you might see heavy IO going on, but you don't know which host that's coming from. PCP can also plot a brocade switch port, bytes per port, bytes transfer per port as well. Okay, let
let me go back to the workbook. Uh, let me just flip through these. I don't ever use always viz. DK viz and MP viz don't perform very well on the large system. If I was on a, uh, let's see, a week ago I was on a thousand CPU system and MP viz was impossible to use there. Uh, PMG XVM I'll use later. Now that those PMDA XVM is running, and I did just demonstrate PMG cluster. So starting off with the beginning, the W command showing me how long I've been up, how many users have come in through the login command, but that does not include PBS or batch or MPI, things like that. We then have the load level. That's a one minute, five minute, 15 minute smooth or rolling average. Averaged across the last one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes. So load level counts all the running, runnable, and sleeping on IO processes. Basically, in top, all the R and the Ds added together is my load level. NFS servers, you could be idle but still have a high load level. In fact, on these systems, I've had a load level in the 200s, but the system has been usable. I've been fine with the top and I.O., but when I did start getting into metadata intensive stuff, then I started feeling the impact. Like logging in through the remote desktop requires a lot of inode references and stuff. Then we have VM staff. VM staff is kind of nice because it's covering the process table, it's covering memory, it's covering swap, it's covering I.O., it's covering interrupts, and it's covering my CPU time. R stands for running. Now, if I have running or runnable processes, slash proc slash sked underscore debug will give me information about what's on each CPU's run queue. B stands for blocked or a process that has gone to sleep on a WCHAN event. So B are for things that are in a D state. Then we got information about swap, how much memory is free, my raw I.O., my cached I.O., and again, that may include slab, dirty, right back, NFS, shemem, tempfs, all those things are in the cache field. Then I got swap ins, swap outs, then I got my I.O., blocks read in, blocks written out, interrupt handler, by the way, I can see that this is actually an itanium sample because the it looks like an eight CPU system that was getting 1,024 clock interrupts per second. Nowadays, you're gonna get 250 clock interrupts per second per CPU. Let me demonstrate something here. Context switches, star dash W, one space four, five. So I'm only about 500 context switches per second. Star dash Q, one space five. Again, showing me a very small run queue, high load level. I'm going to do an int stats, and this is looking at slash proc slash interrupts. I can see my disk interrupts coming in here. I'm going to do a T to make this a delta, and now I'm seeing during this sample, sample, there, sample. During each of the samples, that's the number of interrupts that came in. Now let me go down here, and right here. Here is our, what's called a jiffy or a minor clock tick. We are interrupting the CPU 250 times a second to wake up the CPU scheduler to decide
decide if somebody has exceeded their time slice, and there should be a context switch to somebody that is entitled to the CPU. Now, we are running with what's called a tickless kernel. So in there, we have no hertz equals off. UV config is doing this for us. This is what's causing 250 clock ticks per second on each CPU. If that was not there, we would be in what's called a tickless kernel. And then we basically have one kernel thread that wanders around the whole system dealing with the CPU scheduler. The problem with that is, is that one thread can carry a big load. So if I'm on a 4096 CPU system, this CPU scheduler worker thread starts banging into your application and interfering with it. So rather than having one big thread that's carrying all the CPU scheduling work for a lot of CPUs around with it, we go to a tick kernel where we're getting 250 clock ticks per second. Let me go back to the workbook now. So I talk about interrupts, and with instats, I can pull that apart to see what the interrupts are from. And you're going to get 250 per CPU by default. Then I've got my context switching, swapping processes in and off the CPU. And then I've got my CPU utilization, the user time, the system time, the idle, the wait I.O., and the steal for uh, KVM, VMware, uh, virtualization. I also was using IO stack a little bit earlier today. And in this example, I was looking at a device, and in particular, we were interested in merges. I had seen from S-Trace that my command was doing 32K byte read and writes. But then when I looked at top disk, I saw that it was doing closer to 512K bytes. So I went to IOSTAT and could see that those read requests were being merged together. Something called the elevator. The elevator will sort and merge my IO operations, my IOPS. The other key statistics that I like to see here are the last three. I want the service and the wait to be less than 80 milliseconds. Sometimes I say 60 milliseconds and my percent utilization to be less than 30% busy. Let me move on here. Here's XOS view. One of the problems is the interrupts and getting too noisy. Plus, again, when I got a lot of CPUs, this thing isn't much good past 16 CPUs. I would prefer to use PMG Sys instead. Okay, here's top. So on the top line, we've got how long it's been up how many users have come in through the login command, and my load level, one minute, five minute, 15 minute. I can see something happened in the last minute. I've got 137 processes on this system. A PS-E would count out to that. Four are running in an R state. I can see three of them here, and there's the fourth one down here. 133 are sleeping. Now, the sleeping counts S's and D's. A D is a non-interruptible sleep. Again, for running, I can look at those with perf. For sleeping, I need to look at the tracebacks. I need to look at sleeping with the WCHAN field, the crash backtrace command, echo T into Proxys RQ trigger, or drop into KDB to look at what processes are sleeping and how they got to the sleep. I did show you a stop a few minutes ago where I put something in the background with a control Z, and then it showed up with a state of a T. And then I could find that thing and restart it with a signal 18 to continue it. And right now, we haven't experienced any zombies. I might do that tomorrow. 70%, 69% user time, 13% in the kernel. Again, perf-g is the best way to find out whether that is productive or non-productive time. And we've been seeing for the past two days a lot of non-productive time with compaction. 
and these co- these mem hogs weren't getting their hundred gig. They were sitting there thrashing on a garbage collection compaction. And part of that is because of the large slab that I have. And I don't consider a 30 gig slab very large. So user and system time, we trace out with uh, the perf utility. Nice, the same thing, perf. So nice would be any sort of user or system time that is in a non-standard nice value. Then I got my idle time. Then the wait I.O. time. And if you remember, wait I.O. was based upon the I.O. underscore sked lock. So some of the common wait I.O. events were like that sleep on page. Uh, we also had uh, get request, sync page, a couple other things that are common, I.O. sked calls. Then we've got interrupt handler time. Now, if you're working with Red Hat, watch out for this. Let me go back to my desktop for a second. In here, with this new release, Intel idle C st- max C state. That should be a zero for a UV1 or a one for a UV2. The newest UV config will put it in there based upon your architecture. Without that, I was getting, in Red Hat, was getting huge SI time. Uh, Let me check something here. Uh, right here, PV 102.9869, high SI time. And basically, using perf, we could spot that it was all part of the Intel idle routine. It did not show up on UV2s, but it did show up on UV1s. Long history to the PV here. Here again, looking at the perf report, showing that we're going into CPU idle and Intel idle, and that's where most of that system time was. Uh, Let's see, what do I have here? The system really became unusable when I was going through this. Here they broke out the trace in more detail. And then the suggestion here. So watch for that if you're working with Red Hat. Let me go back to the workbook. So I was given an example where I had high HI and SI time. I do expect to see that when I start profiling on Thursday as well. Moving on. How much memory we have, how much is used, how much is free, raw I.O., Anything in slash dev. Then my swap, swap total, swap use. Note, I don't even have swap here. And then this cache field. And again, I broke out that cache field. In that cache field is slab. And then the dirty, the right back, the NFS unstable, tempfs, shemem, shared text, IPCS, system call shemem, are all part of that cache field. You could do a BC free and not get any of that back because BC free will only trim coherent cash clean type of data. Then I got my PID, my user. Priority is pretty meaningless nowadays, and I can see this as a SLES 10 kernel. Nowadays, the priorities are all 20. Nowadays, the, the scheduling scheme is based upon an entitlement that is visible in the debug, get debug file. The only time priorities really matter is if in your, you're in a real-time market. Nice, we already talked about. Virtual is what I have reserved in memory with a malloc or an MMAP, and RES is what's physically in memory and allocated. 
share I never use. State, R for running, D for a non-interruptible sleep, S for an interruptible sleep. Then we've got my hog factor. This is saying, as we're sampling, this is saying that I was connected to the CPU 99.9% .9 to the last two-second sample. I like to call that my hog factor. Benchmarkers will try to get the hog factor up to 100, saying I'm fully connected to the CPU 100% of the time. But that doesn't mean that that CPU usage is productive CPU use. It could be system time. It could be uh, other non-productive CPU user times that we're going to talk about tomorrow and into Thursday. And that is, by the way, the field the top is sorted on by default. Then we got how much memory, percentage of memory being used, total user and system time, and the name of the process. I do see some issues going on here because I do have a swap daemon running. I am running out of memory. I'm down to 27 meg. There is a sysctl parameter, bm dot uh, min underscore free underscore k bytes that determines at what point how much memory do we try to keep free and at what point does k swap d come in and start to trim or recover memory from the kernel and from the page cache and then start swapping try to move forward here so a question mark and top can give you help i've used the dash o a couple of times to sort by something other than the hog factor. I have not actually done a double yet because I didn't want to mess up your lab exercises. But when I'm done with the way I like my display, a capital W will save a .top RC file off for me. And for fields, this is kind of a default, but I like to have WCHAN in there. By the way, dirty pages does not work. That's null. I do like page faults. This is major page faults. This says I had to go to disk for something. And if it's a shell, I might be going to slash bin to get the executable. When I run out of memory, I will throw away or trim the shared text. It will not swap. And then when I need that shared text again, it will fault it back in from slash bin. So you could be in a state where you don't even have any swap configured and are still getting end faults. This would be to a memory pressure situation. I trimmed everything down to zero, threw away, threw away all my shared text and DSOs, and then had to read them back in. I do like to have the CPU used. And the other one that I mentioned here, swap size. Swap size was simply virtual minus physical virtual minus the RES value. Here's my mem info. There is documentation on the facing page. Again, this cache field includes the uh, NFS unstable, includes the shemem, includes the dirty, and the right back. Also in there would be cache clean and shared text, but those are not counted here. Now it's interesting, in this case, uh, I've got a lot, looks like about 31 gig of memory that's being used, and when I look at it, I've got almost 26 gig that is inactive, and all that is inactive page cache. So a BC free would be able to recover that quickly. What's my slab? My slab's only about 1.2 gig, and most of that is reclaimable. And I also talked about commit limits and commit AS space, but those are pretty meaningless unless you've switched your over commit memory to a two. The facing page has some descriptions. Going into slab top, I always use the dash SC. I'm only interested in the footprint. Ironically, I cheated in this snapshot I added the dash SC later without replacing the screenshot because it's actually sorting by this field. There is a command to plot SAR data called ISAG. 
It is a tickle GNU pot type of interface. Uh, there is, I believe it's sysstat-isag is the RPM that this thing comes in. So here's PM chart. I'm not going to go through a demo of this right now, but I'm looking at an example here. So I've got my CPU utilization. I can see where I started stuff here. A little bit of system time associated with it. Then it went into an IO wait state. Then we had system time associated with it later. Looking at swap here, and I can see swap ran up right to here. And it looks like I ran out of memory and we have an out-of-memory killer. There's a little bit of system time on the end of it as it figures out who is going to kill. And if I look down here, the green here was my cache clean. When I ran a memhog, it sucked up all my memory and trimmed my cache clean down rather quickly, then started swapping, and then right here is where we hit the out-of-memory killer event, and all that stuff went away. And after that, it looks like I did have I.O. going on as well because I see dirty data, and I see dirty data flushing to clean. And then right here, it looks like another memhog was fired up, so it grew. And then right here is when it started doing a reclaim or a trim and started releasing the cache clean. And there also looks to be some flushing going on here as my dirty data dropped down. So there's a lab exercise for you to go in and build different types of charts, in particular this memory plot that I've been showing you. Now I can use a dash A as well to get to an archive. Same sort of thing here. I can see some I08 here. I see an out of memory killer event here. There's a little bit of system time occurring here as it's scanning pages to be able to figure out who can I steal. Let me come back to that. Now, there is a PCP SGI RPM that's adding in a PMDA for the UV. And i got to warn you, on UV2, there is a patch so that the UV statistics work correctly on a UV2. What they did was they cloned the PMDA from a UV1, but they did not assign it a new index number for this group of statistics. Now, I was plotting this, but it was on by default. If it's not on, I have to do a dash capital A to get those statistics. And I was plotting the NumaLink traffic. Here's what DKViz looks like, but again, file systems nowadays are so large, it's pretty hard to work on something that's 1,500 devices. Uh, DKViz just becomes unusable for me. MPViz was also pretty useless on a 1,000 CPU system. Could not keep up with it. Here's a WebViz to get into Apache statistics. Here's the PMG Sys that I was showing you and a PMG cluster. And I do want to point out something for you. I'm going to share my desktop again. When you do one of these things, let me get to my desktop here. I'm going to write bracket quit out of there. PMG sys. If I do a dash capital V, type it into TEE and get me a, a file here. I'm going to quit out of there. PMG sys is the command that generates a scene. The actual widget that is plotting it is called PM gadgets. And you can save time and save this scene so that it doesn't have to be regenerated on a big system. That way you don't have to go through the discovery overhead of building this ASCII file. And in here then is showing you what each of these things are. So I can see where my CPU utilization is, where memory is, all that sort of thing. So the actual command is PM gadgets. And the syntax for building your own dashboard or your own scene are documented here. So there have been cases at a couple of sites where I basically built my own PM 
uh, PMG SIF. And for example, I built one that was just looking at memory on a per node basis, looking at node info, things of that sort. So I had, this was for a, uh, one particular site. Go in there, and then I modified it and organized the whole scene based upon the rack and the IRU and the bay that they're in, and then generated a memory plot for each of the nodes on the system. Oh, let's see. It doesn't like where that is. The man on PM gadgets. Uh, RPM-QA prep for ECP. wondering where it went to. User share man. There it is there. Now this is PM gadgets and the three D scene PM view are not integrated into the open source tree yet. They have been given to them but they're not implemented yet. So let's see if I can fix this one here. Oh shoot, where was it now? Use the share PCP bin. It looks like it got moved somewhere along the way. Let's see if this is going to work. And so this was just trying to show all the nodes and the two racks and how memory was being used on them. But I, I don't have it exactly matched. I don't have all the nodes that this particular dashboard was being built for. Let me get out of there. So I was just trying to show you the PMG sys command, and then I was talking about the dash capital V, which uh, shows the scene that you're generating. You can save that scene and save yourself time regenerating it. And in some cases, I've shuffled that scene around or built my own scene for a particular machine so I could watch things more closely. Okay, TypeSys is an SGI command that comes out of the PCP SGI RPM still. So we get the PID, the user, D stands for Delta. So this SIS here is since the process started, and then the D is during the last sample interval. So if it's, if it's like a five-second sample, this would be the amount of time it's spent in the kernel during that sample. Here's OSViz. It's more useful for uh, multiple network interfaces, kind of web servers, database servers, NFS servers, that sort of thing. Not a whole lot of emphasis on memory or CPU. Node info, I'm going to come back to as needed showing me how much memory is on each socket or node, how much is free, how much is used, and then the dirty and non and slab. And again, I have a RFE and a modified version that is added in Shemem. 
because it's so important to know if a node is out of memory because of shamem allocations on it, like dev shamem or IPCS shamem. And node info did get moved to a new RPM. Now it's in an HW perf, whereas before it was in PCP SGI. Now I've got some of my own tools here as well. I've got something called SPV to plot star PCP and PBS data. I'll use that tomorrow. And it's calling a plotting package called XGraph. Bottom line here is I wrote this back in Cray Unicos days. Cray Unicos came with XGraph built on the system, did not have GNU plot by default and I just built everything around XGraph. SPD is a tickle script that's going to run the SAR command, grep an awk, and then put it into an XGraph format. I can also plot PCP data and PBS data. I also have some ASCII scripts to give me the ProcVM stats data, and I got my own little memstat script. One of the things I don't like about SAR that I wish that they would do something about star dash r, I cannot break out my memory use. So I have my own mem stats. Wait a second, let me get it into the proper path. And this is going to be like a star command, and it's just converting the proc mem info into a flat file. So now I can look at total, free, cache, how much of it is clean, dirty, right back, and on. This is basically what I was stack plotting before. And now I can see everything. I wish that SAR did not bother with these columns and would split things out the way I've done here. So that's kind of a handy script to look at. I was using XFS stats a few minutes ago to look at the XFS statistics. PBS we'll look at tomorrow once we've got PBS data. And I've got a thing to look at a CPU set that we're going to use on Thursday. And also, DLOOK summary has been integrated into the next release. And in my case, it seemed uh, I, my memhawks actually terminated before I was done there. So let me come back to that later. Here's what SPV looked like. And here was an NMON. And in lab, I'm going to give you the lab assignment overnight, but play with W and uptime. Use the top command. Use VM stat and SAR. Use the PM chart command and build a stack bar like I did for memory. Save the data with the record option and then play that back. I'd like to do something before a break here. Let me go back to my desktop here. For one thing, I've got this thing running here. Let me try to get it smaller. Now, if I go up here, let me go to all first and do the record I start. It's now going to save what I'm seeing once I start recording off into my home.pcp PM logger directory. We need to see your desktop, Dave. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So I brought up PM chart and under record I said start a recorder and notice I now have a red light going on down here. So let me just uh, close this off now. Let me put it in the background. Let me go into the .pcp directory, PM logger, and then there, these are scenes or files to actually plot everything, but the actual data is in here. So I'm going to go into Floyd 3 here. And here's the file that I'm presently generating. And I can do a PM chart dash A on the dot zero file.
And now it's coming up with archive down in the corner here. I have to be able to open up a scene, so let me open up a view here. Let's use the one that I already had. Uh, it didn't save some of the stuff. The only thing that got saved in that archive was the current scene. So the only thing that was actually visible was in this stuff because that's what I had visible when I put the recorder on. Now if I click down on archive, I get this little VCR, DVD player type of paradigm here. So I can back this up and see that this started at 11.23 and went to 11.24. And I can see what's going on within that data. Now I'm going to get out of there. And I just want to see if we actually have system data going on in VAR, log, TCP, PM logger. Oops. So it looks like PM logger was not configured on this machine yet. Uh, let me get out of here. I'm assuming, Mike, you've got something on Floyd One. Huh. My VNC viewer died. So one of the lab steps that one of you missed was to get PM logger running. Let me just check this system. I'm going to go into var, lib, PCP, config, PM logger. And one of the lab exercises was to drop, let's just see what we got here, control file. Drop in a file that was my file. By the way, and Mike, you got to watch for this. Some of these things are still IRIX files. I do a more on config.pcp or SAR, for example. These are all IRIX naming conventions. They are not Linux. So we don't have a good one for Linux yet. Let me do a more on control. And what you needed to do was to have this thing uncommented. It's a primary PM logger. Oh, and it look, Mike, did you, uh, looks like you didn't change the config to say. So you're probably not going to have a whole lot that's in that file except load level. You follow me, Mike? Yeah, I'll got it, yeah. So I'm just going to check here on config.default. I used to drop my file into config.default. But then I said, well, why step on the vanilla one? So really all you've got in yours is load level right now. So I would change that. Let me copy home, guest, sys a, underscore labs, labs, uh, zero three, config dot sys a. You already had it there anyway. And then check config, PM logger. So that is on. Let me edit the control file. I can have multiple instances. I could have this running on a different system as well. I'm just going to go with that one. Service, PCP stop. I could probably just do a PM logger stop. Let me do that one and see how that works. This uh, PM logger service is new with the uh, November release of Performance Suite and the PCP that was picked up there. So now I'm going to go into var log PCP, go into PM logger, go into host name. 
and there are their files. And again, you didn't get very much from yesterday, but let me do a PM chart dash A on this file here. And the only thing I've got in there is load level. So let me just open up a view and get my load average. There it is there. Notice it's pointing to an archive here. Click on here. And now I can take a look and see that this started Tuesday at 5 in the morning and is going to 10 o'clock. I can drop it back in here and start plotting the data. I can see my load level is at 120. I can speed it up. So I can zip through the data. I can stop it, go backwards. But with just the load level, there wasn't much of interest to us there. So that was kind of a post-mortem looking at an archive, whether it was there or in the home directory of the of the user that's saving the archive. I'm going to wrap up for a break here. So there was a dash A to plan an archive. I've used PMG Sys. Again, MPVIS is uh, kind of hard to use in a large CPU system. It's too slow. Same thing with DKVIS. And mine. Let me go to that one for a second. The thing I like about NMON is that I can group disk drives. So if I just do an NMON, uh, let me get it here. Uh, I want to copy everything that's in the uh, guest bin directory. There are things in there that I don't need or want, but I'm just lazy and just copy everything there. So now let me try an NMON. So there's NMON. Now it's curses driven. Not very good on the CPU again because on a large CPU system, I really can't see a whole lot. PMG Sys is the only easy way to look at CPU utilization there. I was waiting to see if I'd actually, I got some high water marks here, but I'm not seeing any user system or idle time. We quit out of there, bring it up again. I can go into memory. Let me go to disks. So here the problem now is I'm down on a per partition. For example, B would show up twice. And I don't like that. So what I can do, I'm going to create a file. I'm just going to call it disk group. And in that file, I'm going to say slash is SDA and SCR is SDB. Now I do my nmon g on that disk groups, type in G, and now I don't have to do mapping of device names to file systems. I see every device that's in that group, and I've said it is root. And I'm not going to see that dirty data or that disk drive go busy until I get enough dirty data to actually kick in the flush daemon. So let's see. I'm on Floyd 1. Do I have? No, I don't have PCP on the system yet. There. Now I can start to see Scratch going busy. So if I were to go back, let me get out of here. On Floyd 3, it's a little bit more complicated. So root is SDA. Uh, Scratch, SDB, let's see. I don't even have SDB loaded here right now. And then I've got this LVM. 
So that LVM I went through yesterday to pull it apart, and I've got my notes here right now, and that pow system was two concatted stripes with two paths to each. So I'm going to say uh, SCR underscore one for the first concat is SDD and SDI and SDJ and SDE. Let me do it differently. E, SDI, SDJ. Now I did that yesterday and I'm just using my notes from yesterday. Then I had a second concat that was two lun striped and two paths to it. So it was SDF, SDG, SDK, and SDL. And then I had my log, which was SDH and SDM. Now this is a rather simplistic case where I've got two lines with two paths, but maybe it's 16 paths to it or something like that. So I'm able to group a whole bunch of disks into a single group. Now, there are times when you look at the, uh, I don't have it here, let's see, more on nmon.c. There is a uh, hard code here for, well, it's the wrong system here. There is a uh, hard code for the number of disks that you can handle at 256. And if you got more than that, then you're in trouble. So let me bring up home guest, this A, no, bin, nmon-g on the disk groups. Type in G. And now I'm able to see my I.O. consolidated a little bit better down to the concat objects the log, and that sort of thing. That's the main reason that I like Nmon, is now I don't have to go through my process of mapping a device like SDK and to figure out what it is. Now I can see my I.O. on a per file system basis and chase it back from that. Okay. So that's the main reason I like Nmon, is the ability to have disk groups and consolidate. Let's take a break. I'm going to go through one more module. Let's take a break for 15 minutes and come back at quarter two. And then we'll do this perfect Val module. Okay? So we'll see you in 15 okay. minutes. Okay.